Good morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome to church. Happy Sunday, everybody. How's everybody doing? Wow. So this morning we got started on some of our Sunday school classes. We had our first steps class for people that are still trying to learn about our church and what we believe and our theology. So that was off to a good start. And then we had our biblical interpretation class which is where we're trying to teach people, instruct people about how to study God's word for themselves and draw truth from it. So if you're interested in learning more about studying the Bible for yourself, this biblical interpretation class will actually be offered twice a week. It's going to be on Sunday mornings, or you can take it on Thursday evenings at 6 o'clock. So if you've been wanting to learn how to study God's word for yourself, that's a great way and place to do that. I'd also like to call attention to the fact that out in, outside of our sanctuary here, we have, um, you'll see we have got baby bottles out there. So our congregation really believes in trying to advocate uh, for life. And so one of the ways that we do that is by supporting the Thrive uh, Medical Clinic. They used to be called the Pregnancy Care Center. And so what it is is it's these bottles, and you can take these bottles, and you can put change in them or bills or checks or whatever, and then they use this to help support uh, taking ultrasounds for moms and some of the other kind of things, the financial expenses they have there. So I'd like to invite you to think about participating in that. Uh, one other thing I wanted to mention to you is the fact that yesterday was the 20th uh, anniversary of September 11th, which for many people throughout the country and around the world is a very traumatic event. Um, I was just a child when it happened as a little boy, and uh, for many of us, maybe we weren't even born yet when September 11th happened, but uh, September 11th is a really important day to remember because there are so many people that were affected in so many different ways. So during our prayer time together, we're going to offer up prayers for the families of people that have struggled, whether that be overseas, whether that be here. Um, we're going to take some time in our prayer time to address that. But I'd want to mention it and just say it is something that we want to commit to the Lord in prayer. Uh, those are our major announcements this morning. If you'd like to stand, we're going to have our time of worship together. Good morning, everyone. So um, we're going to focus on the greatness of God and how he is everything to us. Do you believe that? That he is everything that you would ever need? So as we sing this first song, and it's, uh, it talks about the, the many, many different aspects of our Lord, I want you to focus and think about what is he to you? Take 
Father, we come to you by the Lord Jesus Christ through your Holy Spirit. God, we lift up to you that today there are people all over the world that grieving what happened 20 years ago yesterday. People who have borne up in the Middle East in constant war. People here who had sons and daughters go overseas and give their lives. We pray for people that have been to war and returned and still have the scars that come from the trauma of being a part of war still on their bodies and on their minds. And Lord, that picture of turmoil is felt by every person in every heart because everybody goes through struggles and trials and difficulties. In this world, it seems that it's very difficult to find peace. We know you sent your son, Jesus, that we might have peace and have it to the fullest. But sometimes that reality seems so far away. God, I pray for the turmoil that our nation is experiencing even now between people of different political affiliations people of different perspectives, people of different income levels, wars over what our identity is, whether it's found in a characteristic we have on the outside or whether it's something from the inside. God, we lay all these hurts bare before you. God, we ask that you as the good physician, that you as loving father, will hear the prayers of your children here on earth. We open our hearts to you knowing that any time we open our hearts to anybody, there's a risk of being wounded. But Lord, I lead this people now in opening my heart before you, praying that you will heal the hurts that I have. And pray that the people that are here gathered together with us and those that are viewing online will take a moment to open their heart to you, great physician, that you can do your healing work in us. God, I thank you that you've given us so many blessings and so many things to be thankful for. But sometimes we get caught up in the here and the now and in the moment. So I also give you prayers of thanks and gratitude. You've given me personally so much to be thankful for. You've given me a family that loves me. You've given me this wonderful church to worship with. You've given me friends. You've given me food to eat every day. You've given me a warm place to stay. I am, have so much to be grateful for, Lord. I pray on behalf of your people here that we will express to you our hearts of gratitude for all the good things that you've done for us. This world can be very dark at times, but you are the good God who loves us, the good God who watches over us, and the good God who holds us together by the power of your word. We offer these prayers up to you, God our Father, knowing that you are eagerly attentive to us. You are that loving Father that some of us never had. I pray that you will see fit to come and be worshiped together by your people here today. I pray that as the word is preached this morning, that it will go through and it will convict, that it will change our hearts, that we will be tenderhearted towards your word, and that we will not be 
that group of people that were found resisting the work of the Holy Spirit in us. We're imperfect people, Lord. We know that we need to be changed into the image of Jesus. And we pray that you will do that in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My friends, you may be seated. Uh, kids, I am so glad that you guys are here with us to worship and to participate in our prayers and things like that. Uh, every week that I hear little voices and I hear sometimes even little ones crying or things like that, it just reminds me that God's church is still alive. So we love the fact that there are little voices and little footsteps and little things. May there never be a day in which those things are not found in our church. Uh, kids, I'm going to dismiss you now knowing that we love you and we're so glad that you're here with us, but you're dismissed now to go to uh, our kids' ministry. I notice we have a number of newcomers here today, and what I want you to know is that after our service, we typically have like coffee and cookies and things like that, so please hang around after service to get to meet a few people and to hang out with us here. Uh, I want to invite up Pastor Bill Johnson, who will be preaching our message today. If you don't know Pastor Bill, he's probably my best friend that I have uh, in this world, and I've learned more about preaching from Pastor Bill than just about anybody else. Uh, we're in a four-part series called The Big Four, and Pastor Bill will talk a little bit about that, but I personally asked him to preach this message because he, this is something he and I have talked about many times before, and I think there's great value and great profit to be had by God's people. So, Pastor Bill, if you come on up, my friend, thank you. you can divide the word for us, and <laughs> thank, thank you, you for doing it. Thank you, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, if you're joining us online, it's great to be here. Some of you know I actually live uh, in Grand Rapids, uh, just kind of south of Grand Rapids. I come up here uh, often on the weekends and other churches, and yeah, I ride a motorcycle a lot. And boy, I tell you what, this morning's motorcycle ride up from Grand Rapids was glorious, just beautiful. 65 degrees, I saw no deer which for a guy that rides a motorcycle is always a very, very good thing. So it's great to be here. I'm excited. Uh, this is an interesting series that came about. Pastor Luke and I went away on a retreat for a few days, and we're just talking about kind of all that we teach and we preach. And I, I had noticed that some of the sermons he had preached ended up almost being like greatest hits. I've had called on him at other times to preach some of those messages in other settings. And so he came up with this idea, which I love, this, this phone. You know, we all have, I you almost always have my phone with me. We have the, you know, all the stuff that we use day to day. But down there at the bottom, you know, we have those four that are usually the ones we use the most. I have my calendar there, right? I have my work calendar there, right? Those are the ones we use the most. So what we want you to kind of try to come to understand is there's many things. We, we're with Pastor Luke's preaching, we've learned many things, but these four are probably going to be ones that will be themes that we interact with throughout life here at Journey Church. In fact, we talk about these in board meetings and staff meetings and, and what is the Spirit doing and these lines of your, your, we'll talk about your sarks is showing and the cure that kills and the, is, and I love, the, is there a priest in the house? Is there a priest in the house? So we're going to work through these four. Uh, today we're going to talk about a theme I've talked about a lot, this idea of the Trinity and the Spirit and what I call gangster God. Yes, I said gangster God. We're going to talk about it. In fact, I have to apologize. I'm probably going to break more sermon preaching rules this morning that I would probably mark my students off for, but I can do it, I think, because I'm the one that gets to do that. So I'll tell you some of the ones I'm going to break. First of all, you have no notes. You see how you have no notes? No note cards. No slides to go with it. This entire sermon, I have all the notes that are going to be available when you leave this, if, this morning. All the references, all the scripture. I don't want you taking notes. I want you looking at me because we have a lot to cover. 
I'm going to tell you how this sermon's going to go. You're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to build some suspense, have some inductive things, and sneak up on it and come up with something cute at the end. It's going to have none of those. We're going to talk about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. That's what we're going to talk about. And we're going to talk about it in a doctrinal way, and then we're going to talk about it in a relational way. And then at the end, we're going to say, okay, Pastor Bill, that's cute. So what? What does it matter? And that's how this sermon's going to go. So I took all the suspense away. This sermon better be good enough to carry itself on its own because I'm not that funny and I'm not that cute. So let's see what we can get done, all right? Here's what happens with Pastor Luke and I. I know Pastor Molly hears this, Pastor Nate. These questions come up, and laugh if you want. I've got my contacts in, but I still need my reading glasses, so you can laugh if you want. Here's what people ask us. Some people will come up and say, you know, I'm wrestling with sin. How do I not sin? I love that idea. It's like not thinking of a pink elephant, right? Good luck with that. Am I living the way God would want me to? I I don't really know. Am I I praying the right way? Am I praying? How, How do I know more about the Bible, people ask us? Common questions. Now, the good news is, here at Journey, we're going to offer classes that will help us do that. Wonderful classes. Pastor Luke has a schedule and teachers and all that. So we're going to give you some ways to think about those things. But I want to talk to you about it today from a Trinitarian perspective. Now, I want you to raise your hand if you feel comfortable. I'm going to ask some questions. And I want you, if this question you kind of say, yeah, I I think I'm maybe there, and you feel comfortable, raise your hand. Are you feeling, when it comes to your faith, your faith right now, are you feeling great about it? If you're feeling great about it, like it's like an A plus, I'm hitting on all cylinders. If you feel comfortable, raise your hand. All right, nice. If you're feeling pretty good about it, like I feel pretty good, I'm kind of good, but got things to grow, places to grow, raise your hand, okay? If you're feeling discouraged, like, I, boy, maybe I've been at it, and now I'm wondering, and the world tells me this, and I'm hearing this, and maybe I'm a little discouraged or a little bit confused or just not sure about where you are in the faith. If that's where you are, raise your hand. It's okay. I have been there, absolutely. Professor friends have written fantastic books about it. Do you feel like you're making a difference, not for yourself, but for the kingdom of God? Do you feel like you're making a difference for the kingdom of God? Okay. I went through a period of time where I was expanding my kingdom, and I wasn't expanding God's kingdom. Do you feel victorious in your faith? Do you feel like faith is something that you're like, I'm winning? Do you feel that way? If so, raise your hand. Yes. If you're wrestling with, I feel like I lose more than I'm winning, like if I didn't score, I feel like I might not be winning as much as I would like. Raise your hand if you're there. Okay, awesome. Do you feel like the Bible guides you? Raise your hand. Guides you. Okay, good, good. Here's a tough one. Are you actively discipling someone else weekly. Raise your hand. Okay, good. Ah, That's a lot of work on your part. I made you like do your exercises today. Okay, let's pray. Let's get into this. God, we're thankful for your word. It does not change, yet it is dynamic and interactive and living and breathing. Help us to move in that place where we know it with our heads, and we feel it with our hearts, Father. I pray for each of us. We're all in different places in this faith journey. Some of us are discouraged. Some of us are skeptical. Some of us may even be like, I don't know if I want that anymore. And some of us are, but your word meets us there, Father. I pray as we interact this morning that who you are as a Trinitarian God would change how we see you. We pray in your name. Amen. Now, let me be clear, I'm going to talk about the Trinity this morning, but history of the church has proven that there's only three things that are vital to transformational faith. Three things vital to transformational faith. Number one is a devotion to Scripture. 
devotion to Scripture. I'm choosing those words carefully. I'm not talking just about an app that pops a verse to me, although that's good. A book I read, uh, uh, an author called that uh, Scripture McSnacking. It's like a chicken nugget. It's food, kind of. (laughs) It's part of it. But devotion to Scripture, to a life devoted to prayer, And three, an interactive faith community. Now let me be clear. A faith community that interacts with me, that challenges me. Just so you know, I have enough middle class uh, white guys over 50 in my life. I don't need more middle class, nothing against them. I'm one of them. I'm not looking to not be around them. There's just enough of them around me. I don't need more of that. I need more perspectives, I need more thoughts, I need more ideas that challenge and push and we interact together. And that's how community is formed. And your faith is built on those three things. But today, I'm going to submit to you that the greatest transformation in your faith, coming even through those three, will be in a relationship and in a relational understanding of the Trinity. Now, if you're new to the Christian faith, you may have heard this idea of Trinity. If you've been in the faith a long time, the Trinity means God the Father, God the Son, who we call Jesus, and God the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. Three separate, yet one person. It's a doctrine unique to the Christian faith. And as I've understood other faiths and I've studied other faiths, I have just found that the Christian doctrine of the Trinity, its uniqueness to us, is its secret behind how it can transform us. So let's begin with God the Father. By the way, when I teach this at the seminary level, I love to make my seminary students try to put them in order, right? Because if I had a whiteboard here, we'd write God the Father at the top, we'd write God the Son, Jesus, second, and we write the Holy Spirit, God, the Holy Spirit, third, and we'd kind of put them in order from top, to, right? Is that how they are? Is Jesus first? Or is Jesus at the bottom? Is the Holy Spirit at the top? Holy Spirit. Where? Good luck with that. I want to see one of you come up after class. The whiteboard's out there. Let's draw it and see what we can come up with. But I'm going to start with God the Father. Now, let me be clear. In Scripture, God reveals himself as Father. I know the culture wants to talk about questioning and identity, and that's okay. That's up to them. They can do that. But the God of the Bible says, I am Father. That's what he calls himself. Now, I also recognize that some of us may not have had great fathers. And we often put that. Someone, I, author I read, he, he said, it took me 50 years to wipe my father's face off the face of God. I recognize that fathers haven't always done great things, but there have been great fathers, mine being one of them. He's far from perfect, but a good man. And so father matters. Now, you don't have to turn in your Bibles. I've got all the verses out there. Listen to this, Psalm 68, 5. A father of the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy habitation. John 14, Jesus says this famous, and we'll get to this later, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Romans 8, 15, for you have not received the spirit of slavery leading to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption. As sons and daughters, we cry out, Abba, Father. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. Matthew 6, 10, in this manner, therefore I pray that famous prayer. How does it start? Our Father who art in heaven. God is Father. Now this is where it's going to get a little kind of funny, okay? Now, I'm a dad. I got three, okay? Two daughters, son, okay? So I've been through the college years, the teenage years, and the little years, okay? But I can tell you, and I'm going to ask you, when you think about, like, 
a good father that you might know, what is it kind of the, like the number one thing with most fathers to do what? Listen. Obey. Right? Am I out on a limb here that like most fathers are like, and I even hear the mom say, do what your father said. Or the dad will say, do what your mother said. Obedience matters. See, God will tell us, I remember sitting with my mentor, he didn't have many days to live, and I said, is it better to love God or to obey God? And he said, yes. You see, we live in a culture that we want the love of God, but we don't want the obedience of God, and it's a big thing to him as it is with many fathers. In fact, the voice cries out, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, and then we don't usually remember what comes after that. Do what he tells you to do. Obedience. It matters, for sure. And we could go through stories, and when I first wrote Gangster God, it was because of disobedience that bad things happened to people. Deuteronomy 6, 3 says, O Israel, you should listen and be careful to do all these things that it may be well with you and multiply greatly. Deuteronomy 30, for this commandment which I command you today, it's, now listen to this, this is Old Testament. It says, it's not too difficult for you, nor is it out of reach. It is not in heaven where you would say, who will go up to heaven for us and get it and make us to hear it that we would observe? Who's going to, a voice comes from heaven. Who's going to cross the sea to get it for us? It's not too difficult, but the word is very near you and in your mouth and in your heart that you may observe it. If you diligently obey the Lord your God, Be careful to do the commandments which I command to you. You see, this obedience thing with God matters. And and many things in the culture don't want to be told what to do. I'm not telling you I love being told what to do. I'm not really particularly good at it, to be honest with you. Watch the speed limit signs, and you'll see I don't do particularly well with some of those, especially on two wheels. A little confession. We'll delete that later. I don't like them telling me that in a construction zone it's 45. I can go through much quicker on my two wheels. But obedience matters to God. And here is why. It took me a long time to understand this. Obedience matters to him, not because of him, but because of us. Our disobedience has no effect on holy God. He is imminent, high, and mighty. He is holy other. He is creator. I am creature. So if he's so upset with disobedience, we have to ask ourselves why. Because disobedience doesn't harm him. Guess who it harms? It harms us. And every one of us could probably get up and tell multiple stories about a time we knew what we were supposed to do. And we didn't do it. And we harmed ourselves and we harmed others. That's what disobedience does. He sees what it does not just to us because none of us live on an island. But we hurt each other when we disobey Obedience matters. And God is not just gangster. And God is not just the good grandpa who's okay with everything. God is not just the good father who gives blessings. He's all those things. And if we try to put him into one thing, we'll fall short. He's more gracious than you could ever imagine. And he's more holy than you could ever believe. And then Jesus, the Son of God, as I'm Coming to understand, you've heard me preach before about him as the God-man. I think everything about what we're trying to understand rests with Christ as the God-man. 
Colossians tells us he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in heaven, that spiritual realm, and earth, the physical realm, visible and invisible. Now listen, this is, this is right out of God's word. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created by him and for him. Do you ever interact with a situation or a person? You get the distinct sense there's something else going on. There's almost as if there's a dark force behind what's happening. And you wonder, well, I'm just interacting with a person. No, there are thrones and dominions and rulers and authority from the spiritual realm messing with what we do here. And that's why Jesus is the God-man, both God from the spiritual realm, man from the physical earthly realm. He can cover it all. And he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself might come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. He is king of the spiritual realm. He's king of the earthly realm. He didn't come to serve, to be served. He came to serve. In a weird way, Jesus is kind of relationally, I see Jesus as our big brother, that perfect big brother, like 10, 15 years older than you, drives the cool car, can get everything done. Anybody had a big brother that was like the perfect big brother? Anybody like just like was the coolest, everybody in town knew him, like that's your big brother, man. He's there for us, he's with us, he's the God man. But guess what he also knows Rejection and suffering, humiliation. I see that posted sometimes. People will say, well, it's okay for humility, but we shouldn't be humiliated. No one should humiliate us. I don't know about all that. If Jesus is our perfect example, maybe how we handle humiliation as people of faith might speak differently to the world. He was scorned and rejected. Any of us that have gotten to the bottom of that dark, dark pit where things get really dark, everyone is abandoned and gone. You will find Jesus at the bottom of that pit. He will reach across in the darkness when you can't see. You'll feel his hand on your hand. With Jesus, we're never alone. God is the one we are to obey, and Jesus is the big brother, the God-man, who tells us you are never alone, ever. And then the Holy Spirit. You've heard me say the Holy Spirit is the active agent, the person of the Trinity that is most transformational for us. Jesus says, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all the things that I said. We don't just have a God that says, I want you to obey. We have a Christ that says, I'm going to walk this out with you. And then on top of that, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you get the Holy Spirit in you to empower you from the inside out to live the life. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments and I will ask the Father and he'll give you that helper that he may be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. Because it does not behold him or know him, but you know him. Now listen to this. Because he abides with 
you and will be in you. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you already have the Holy Spirit of God living in you. Okay, I got an idea. Somebody go, amen, Pastor Bill, because I couldn't pull it off any other way. I'm too screwed up. But the Holy Spirit of God says, I empower you. We're going to talk about how. And he is the teacher Now listen, Romans 1, you don't have to turn there, but our God is a God of truth. Obedience matters to him and truth matters to him. Romans 1 says the culture has what are called truth suppressors. They suppress it. They push it down and they suppress it everywhere they can go. But our God is a God of truth and we know what it says. The truth sets you what? Lies have kept all of us, me included. Lies kept me prisoner for much of my life. Lies do not free us, but the truth does. And Jesus comes along and says, what class? I am the what? Way, the truth, and the life. Now listen to what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, I just dispense truth. He looks at us and says, in my very person, I am the truth. And it sets us free. And the Holy Spirit is the great teacher. Now here's where it starts to get tough, class. This is where it gets tough. Pastor Luke's going to preach a whole message on your sarks is showing, your flesh. Inside we have flesh and spirit. Now, guess what flesh is? I was always raised kind of like your flesh is like your carnal, like your sinful nature. Yeah, kind of. But I'll tell you what your flesh is. You know it. You're in line at Meijer, right? And you're four people, right? One, two, three. And you're doing your social distancing. You're keeping your six feet, right? And someone decides that's a good spot to get in front of you in that six feet. They come along and they, they step in front of you, right there, to that spot. You want to know what your flesh is? What's your flesh? Your flesh says this, that person is the image of God. <laughs> and I love them because I'm supposed to. And you turn to them and say, can I help you? Because obviously you're more important than me. So how can I help you, right? Right? What does your flesh do inside? Now listen, church people, I'm talking to you. What does your flesh do inside? (laughs) How dare they? What could they do? And who do they think they are? And if I was, and I love that line from the Wizard of Oz. She looks at the witch and says, if I wasn't a good church lady, why I would... Your flesh is always right there. Your flesh sees a sign you don't like. A person may be different from you. Your flesh has always got something to say about that. I can tell you that the vast majority of my flesh is generally not the best spiritual pastor bill response. There's some funny stories in my house that should stay in my house about pastor bill doesn't always be good pastor bill. To live by the Spirit, we have to submit and yield. Do you like that? Do you like submitting and yielding? Do you like like when the Bible says do this and you're like, I don't want to do that? Because listen to me, class. 1 Corinthians 1 says uh, the definition of love, love is two things first. Love is patient and love is kind. And I see our church people Facebook responses, and most of them are not those two things. They're not patient. We're not kind. We need to be known for that. Our flesh does not want to be patient and kind. Our flesh wants to make sure they know that's wrong. That's the truth. 
We must yield and submit. The flesh wants what the flesh wants. And the only power the flesh has is what we often give it. How do we deal with sin? That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through the Holy Spirit in your inner person. Ephesians 3.16. Now listen, this is a hard one class. For if you live according to the flesh, the self, you will die. Now let me tell you what I mean by this. This happens in Genesis 3. She looks at the fruit and the serpent says, you won't surely die. What does it mean to die in a biblical way? It means to be separated from God. She didn't drop dead. If she would have, Adam wouldn't have eaten it. We've joked for a long time about Adam and Eve in the garden, like after the fall, like did he bring it up to Eve every single time? Oh, that's right, you ate the fruit and gave it to me. Like how did that go, right? Because the flesh always has something to say about it. You see, death is separation from God. When we live by the flesh, we separate ourselves. The flesh separates us from God. And we can't have life without him. And so disobedience and flesh separate us. All sin starts with some lie. And then we look at that lie and then we, we garner it. We take it into ourselves. Eve had it all in the garden. But she believed a lie. And the Holy Spirit reminds us of truth. When you feel tempted with sin, I guarantee you there's a lie there. This porn site's going to give me something that I can't get any other way. This outrage, this anger, this temper, this what, it's going to give me something, and therein lies the lie. It doesn't give you anything. In fact, the way the lie works is it gives you nothing. It promises you everything. And ultimately, talk to any addict, it will take away everything. That's what the lies do. If you're stuck spiritually and you feel like there is more out there, God is a God of depth. 1 Corinthians 2 says, The things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches you, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man, the man, the person that lives out of just their mind and nature, does not receive the things of the Holy Spirit, for they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. And this is one of my favorites. Pastor Marlon, I've talked about this before, but God has revealed them to us through his spirit. Now listen, the spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. Who searches the deep things of God but the Holy Spirit? And guess what? You have that in you. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, it's in you. So now what do we do? How do we live this out? Great, Pastor Bill. Kind of, you're excited. I can tell you're excited. So you must be something important. Galatians 5 tells us, and, and, and I don't have a cute close for our time this morning. I, I do have a challenge for you. You see, Galatians 5.16 says that if we walk in the Spirit, you won't fulfill what the flesh wants. I can tell you the Spirit's going to call you into things uncomfortable. The Spirit's going to call you into things risky. We've talked about that before. 
But the, the self, the flesh, sets itself against the spirit. Admit it. Pastor Luke's going to talk about it like the flesh wants what the flesh wants. And they're contrary. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under that law. Now, here's how we know. If you've been raised in church, you've probably heard of the fruits of the Spirit. We as good church people generally know them, right? What are they, class? Come on. Hear them out loud. Joy. Come on. Kindness. What else? Goodness. Gentleness faithfulness, self-control, like we, we got those down. So if, if, if you look at us as church people and you see tons of that stuff, we're probably walking by the Spirit. But we generally don't know the Spirit or the, the, the fruits of the flesh. Listen to this. God's lists scare me. When he makes lists, I get a little nervous. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery. Listen to this one. Hatred contentions, jealousies, outbursts, wrath, selfish ambition, dissensions, envy. Here is the problem. I can tell you I live a fair amount of that sometimes in my life. I hate, I get mad, I'm angry, I have outbursts and... Uh, that's proof that I'm not living by the Spirit. I am going to ask you this week, and I'm not going to make you raise your hand like I did before. I'm going to ask you to trust God at his word. That if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, that Holy Spirit was put in you. You have it. The power of it is in you. And it's the same power that raised Christ. So I'm going to challenge you just this week. Just this week, as you go through your week, the transformational aspect of our Trinity, that obedience matters, truth matters, living like Jesus matters, and living in the Spirit and not the flesh, it matters. And so this week, I'm going to ask you to double down, throw it hard into the Spirit, and just pray, and I'm going to pray for us, that we walk by the Spirit. And here's where it's going to get hard. When you pull out of here and someone cuts you off. When you see something pop up on Facebook. When you see a news story. In that moment, you're going to pray to yourself, Spirit, what do you have for me here? What do you have for me? Please stand so we can pray. God, you are more gangster and holy than we could ever imagine, and you are more gracious and forgiving than we could ever believe. I ask you to forgive each of us for the times we just so easily can walk by the flesh, by the self, by what I want to be right, to be heard, to be... As we go out this morning, I pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit, through our yielding and submitting, that the full power of you as Trinitarian God would live in us and through us, and that people would see a lot more love is patient and love is kind. It does not keep records of wrongs suffered. It believes all things and hopes all things, Father. Help us to double down this week in the power of your spirit. We pray in your name. Amen. You are dismissed. You are dismissed. Amen.